and welcome to Dr. Vanderbeen's AP Chemistry Podcast. Today we're talking about the strengths of covalent bonds. Now, as you know, covalent bonds are bonds that form when two atoms share electrons between them. I'd like to talk about bond enthalpy. That'll be the major focus of this podcast. When we talk about bond enthalpy, we're talking about the amount of energy required to break a particular bond in one mole of a gaseous substance. And when we talk about bond enthalpies, these are always positive quantities. In other words, breaking bonds is endothermic. It takes energy to break a bond. Typically, these bond enthalpies are presented as average values, where they look at the bonds that are present in a whole bunch of different molecules, and they, can, they take the average from all those different situations. All right. The other thing that I wanted to point out is the relationship between bond enthalpy and bond strength. The higher the bond enthalpy, the greater this value, the stronger the bond. If, it, if you have a very large amount of energy required to break a bond, it's because that bond is very strong. Now, bond enthalpies can be very useful because we can use them to estimate the enthalpy change for a chemical process. For example, you can predict as a very quick back-of-the-envelope type of calculation, you can predict, predict if a particular reaction is exothermic or endothermic. You can actually go, they'll get better estimations as to the enthalpy change of the reaction, and that's what I'd like to do right now. In order to do this, what we do is we take the sum of all the bonds that have to be broken, and we sum up all the bonds that are formed, and this, the difference of these two, so we'll take the difference, gives us the overall enthalpy of reaction, or an, a pretty close answer, even if it's not exactly the same as other thermodynamic data, it's close enough that we can use it. Now, in order to do problems like this, you do need to have access to a table of average bond enthalpies. In the brown lemayan Burston textbook that I'm using, it's on page 330. If you're using another AP textbook or college level textbook, it should also be present in your bonding chapter. You can't do this information without the table being given to you. So using, in our textbook, table 8.4, Uh, we are going to estimate delta H for the reaction using average bond enthalpy. Now let's start by looking at our reactants because we're going to be breaking bonds in the reactants. All right, so we have to break one, two, three, four NH bonds. And we have to break one NN single bond. Now, in terms of bond formation, we have to form one nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond, and we have to form two H-H single bonds. All right, and so this is the basic calculation that we, we're doing. Remember, the overall enthalpy is the sum of the bonds that are broken minus the sum of the bonds that are formed. I don't know why, but I always have a hard time remembering that it's broken minus formed. Maybe if I say it a lot, I'll remember it better. But we can, at this point, go to table 8.4, or the equivalent, and get the data that we need. All right, so for bonds broken, we had those four NH bonds. And looking in the table, an NH bond has an average enthalpy of 391 kilojoules per mole. And we had to break the one nitrogen-nitrogen single bond. And that has an average enthalpy of 163 kilojoules per mole. So that's our reactant side. Those are the bonds that are broken. And we need to subtract out the bonds that are formed. We had one nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond, which has an average enthalpy of 941 kilojoules per mole. And we had those two hydrogen-hydrogen single bonds, 
which have an average enthalpy of 436 kilojoules per mole. So we have to add all this up and do our math, get our calculator, and when I do this out, I get an answer of minus 86 kilojoules, which is reasonable. So it turns out this reaction overall is exothermic with that negative delta H value. Great. Let's go on and talk about bond order so we can relate it to bond enthalpy. Now, bond order is a fancy way of just saying how many bonds are between those two atoms. All right. Um, right now, let's just talk about integer values for bond order. So if we're talking about a bond order of one, it would be a single bond. A bond order of two would be a double bond, etc. Right. You can actually have fractional bond orders, but we don't need to worry about that right now. What I do want you to know is the relationship between bond order and bond enthalpy. As the bond order increases, the bond enthalpy increases. In other words, triple bonds are harder to break than double bonds, which are harder to break than single bonds. We can actually look at some data to support this. All right. A carbon-carbon single bond has a bond enthalpy of 348 kilojoules per mole. A carbon double bond has an enthalpy of 614 kilojoules per mole. You'll notice it doesn't scale linearly, so a double bond is not twice as strong as a single bond, but it is definitely stronger than a single bond. And a carbon-carbon triple bond has an enthalpy, a bond enthalpy of 839 kilojoules per mole. So as the bond order goes from 1 to 2 to 3, the bond enthalpy also increases. The other relationship that you need to know relates bond order with bond length. As the bond order increases, bond length decreases. So let's look at our bond orders. These are for carbon-nitrogen bonds. As the bond order goes from 1 to 2 to 3, the length of the bond in angstroms goes from 1.43 down to 1.16. So these are definitely inversely related. All right. I always like to say strong bonds are short bonds. All right. Because if they're strong, they have a high enthalpy of uh, a bo high bond enthalpy, but they also tend to be pretty short. Alright, just as a final problem, so we can wrap this up, let's place the species below in order of shortest to longest nitrogen to nitrogen bond. We should probably draw some Lewis structures here. Now for N2, this is a triply bonded substance. Alright, for N2F4, let's put the nitrogens in the middle and the fluorines outside. I'm going to say from looking at this that we must have all single bonds here with lone pairs on the nitrogen all right and lone pairs around each fluorine always show those lone pairs don't forget them don't take the chance that they're counting all the electrons in the scoring rubric and for our last structure we have N2F2 so we'll put the ends in the middle and the fluorines outside Florence, as we know, don't usually make more than one bond. And for this, we must end up with double bonds on the nitrogen, single bonds to the fluorine, lone pairs on each nitrogen. And to fulfill our octet rule, nitrogen uh, lone pairs also around the fluorine. All right, so let's see here. Let's talk about bond order. And we're interested in only the nitrogen-nitrogen bond. So in N2F4, in the N2 and N2F2. All right, well, our bond order here for the nitrogen molecule is 3. Our bond order here for the nitrogen-nitrogen bond is 1. Here, our bond order is 2. Well, we just learned that as bond order increases, the bonds get shorter. So the N2F4 molecule must have the longest bond 
and the nitrogen molecule, the diatomic nitrogen molecule, would have the shortest bond. but the nitrogen molecule would have the highest bond enthalpy. The question didn't ask about that, but we can do it anyway. And the N2F4 would have the lowest bond enthalpy. We'll talk another time. See you later.